Hi, I'm Joe Sorge, and welcome to the Family Law Report, where we discuss the problems and challenges facing our family law system. Today, we're going to talk about the increased involvement of police in family law matters. Are the overburdened courts relying more heavily on police to sort things out in the field? Or have changes in our family laws encouraged people to call the police more often? Or both? We have the good fortune to have retired LAPD police officer Catherine McWillie on the show to discuss these issues. Catherine, thank you for agreeing to appear on the Family Law Report. Yes, thank you so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Tell us about your background as an LAPD police officer and how that led you to get into divorce counseling. Yeah, I uh, I have about 30 years dealing with family law, 24 years as an LAPD officer. And essentially what I saw as my career progressed is that we were responding to more and more radio calls that the causative factor was family law, custody issues, move out issues. We were responding to child abuse investigations where parents would dispute who was supposed to pick up the children a day. And then, of course, the more horrific uh, progression in the crime, which was abductions um, and homicide of both adults and children. Have domestic disputes always been a big part of police work? When I first started as a young police officer, I went on very few police uh, radio calls related to divorce. I can tell you that how we dealt with domestic violence was we would tell one party, the aggressive party, leave the house, come back in the morning. We took very little action compared to now. I, I sort of lean towards perhaps we haven't gone too far where we we take reports on people raising their voice to each Wait other. Wait now, hold on a second. I've heard from anti-domestic violence activists that if someone is reporting domestic violence, it's real. Isn't this increased police involvement a good thing? It's really important to point out here that you have legitimate cases of domestic violence prior to divorce, during divorce, and even after divorce. But if you're talking about the normal family disputes, who doesn't get mad at their spouse? Who doesn't have a disagreement? I mean, look at parents and their own children. Parents love their children, but they will sometimes make the decision to yell at them. They will sometimes put punishment and consequences in place. Why are we saying that you know, it's domestic violence in a relationship and the same behavior is parenting for children. So it sounds like you have to use some judgment out in the field. You know, there's even instances where you have people would purposely strike themselves, scratch themselves to utilize the police to gain an advantage in court. If we're talking about two people who are yelling and screaming or somebody who shoves somebody away from them, to me, I would, not necess I would not classify that as domestic violence. If you didn't think there was an immediate risk, what, what would you do? As law enforcement, we would tell families to go to court to resolve the issues. And then we would be on the radio call again, you know, a week later, two weeks later, or every week for several weeks. And the families would say, we did go to court. Court told us to call the police. Police are telling families, go back to court. It, it was a merry-go-round, and each year it became worse and worse and worse. What do you mean by worse and worse? 25% of the crime is related to family law now. Domestic violence, child abuse, abductions, homicides, stalking, violation of court orders, violation of restraining orders. Those are pretty substantial numbers. What do you think that number was 25 years ago that... 25%. A fraction, a fraction of what it is now. Because the courts, I think, there wasn't the financial incentives to the degree that there is now. There wasn't the fighting that was allowed. What do you mean by financial incentives? You know, if you get a majority of custody, you can see a bump of 30% on your income, and it's non taxable. That's a pretty big financial carrot. Do you think it incentivizes people to fight over getting control of the children? As a, a divorce coach now, since my retirement, um, I tell my clients, you think that getting your final court order is the end of your problems? It's actually just the beginning of the real issues. Everything up to now is 
is opening arguments, uh, uh, opening salvo. It's foreplay compared to what you're now going to go through until your children turn 18. I can imagine these battles increase stress for people. Everything that we do to make the lives of parents more difficult, make the fighting more aggressive in court, adds to the anxiety, adds to the crime, adds to the radio calls. And I, we have a limited time here, so I haven't even gone into the false child abuse allegations, social services. I would say maybe as much as 50 to 60% of my clients would qualify for PTSD if they were diagnosed. How do you think it affects children when parents fight over custody? There's a real belief that the most effective way to hurt the other person is to hurt them through the children. And we're actually seeing that in the worst possible way conceived, which is that we're seeing an increase in child homicides, children murdered by their own parents in the ultimate act of retribution against the other. That's horrific. I, I, I don't know what to say. What could be driving such abhorrent behavior? People are broken by the constant court dates, the constant requests, for documents, more money, more experts. Our system is so broken. And before people even enter the system, they expect to lose their home, their children, their financial future, their career. And in many cases, the depression or the difficulty in dealing with that loss drives some parents to even kill before they even enter the system. So, I mean, that should be one of the biggest reasons driving reform is that parents without even going into the system, just pending the system, commit homicide. It seems tragic to me that our system would foment even one such lethal competition between the parents. Do you think the courts realize what they're doing? I think the courts rarely recognize that they have two good parents under duress. I think they still view as a uh, good parent, bad parent. I see them all the time point their fingers and say, you parents, you're responsible for your actions. You're responsible for the problems. And I say, no courts. You are responsible for the actions. You have the ability to control the behavior of the parents with consequences, and you choose not to. I've heard that courts throw people in jail for not paying their child support, but there are no consequences for failing to cooperate with a custody schedule. Do you think that's fair? If you are being denied the right to see your children, I do not feel you should pay child support. And that would almost correct a majority of the problems overnight. And we used to do that, by the way. Stop hiding behind this position that, oh, the children don't want to see you or the children have activities. No, if you don't show up for work, you don't get paid. Well, mom or dad, your job is to make sure those children show up for custody. Doesn't matter if they want to, doesn't matter if they'd like to, what you've said to them. If they do not show up for custody, are not available, do not have a relationship, you should not be receiving child support. That's part of your job. Why aren't the courts inclined to enforce custody orders? They've said, we don't want to punish the children for the actions of the parents. I, I haven't disclosed, I spent 10 years researching family law, going out and interviewing attorneys, judges, parenting evaluators, police officers, fire, nurse, and so on. First time I heard that, I go, oh yeah. And then I said, what's wrong with this? We hold children more accountable for their actions as juveniles than we do parents in family law. How do you think we might solve a lot of these problems? Both parents should have custody, shared custody. And then if we have that presumption, parents might be more comfortable giving and taking in each other as opposed to this battle. Personally, I wouldn't be surprised if the amount of domestic violence decreased if we had shared custody. What's driving a lot of family law is fear. Fear that you're going to either lose custody or not be able to see your children. I don't know that the current situation where both parties fight to take custody from one or the other has done any benefit to the system. In fact, I think it's been far more detrimental. If you get 
both mothers and fathers together, they both want the same thing. They want fairness and they want to see and have access and be a part of their child's lives. Well, I think it's a tragedy. The family law system has turned that basic human desire into a business with so many negative ramifications. That's another interview in itself. <laughs> well, thank you, Catherine McWillie, for appearing on the Family Law Report and for giving us an inside view from the perspective of a law enforcement officer and a divorce coach. It was my pleasure. Thank you again for the invitation and look forward to perhaps a second conversation. So we looked into some government statistics on family-related homicides. It turns out that about one in 200,000 men are killed by their intimate partner. For women victims, the rate is about double. But the real shocker is for children under the age of five. It turns out that parents kill their infant children at a rate of about five per 200,000. And although one might suspect men to be the aggressors here, it turns out that mothers and fathers are about equally murderous. To put the infant homicide rate into perspective, it's responsible for a greater number of deaths in children under the age of five than gun accidents, poison, fire, pneumonia, cancer, accidental drowning, or motor vehicle accidents. What could be driving parents to murder their infant children at such a rate? Homicides involving ex-spouses seem to get all the news coverage and attention from politicians. But while infants are victimized at twice the rate of adult partner homicides, no one seems to be clamoring to put billions of dollars into a Violence Against Children Act. The family courts just continue to host their destructive custody battles, and lawyers continue to reap their blood money. If you find this as disturbing as we do, please contact your elected officials and let them know. It's time to stop serving family law special interests and start serving the people. Custody is for prisoners, not children. The best parent is both parents. I'm Joe Sorge. This is the Family Law Report. Thank you.